So it is a really big pleasure for me and for the ICA to have William in our galleries and on our stage tonight. Please join me in welcoming William Kentridge, Peter Gallison, and Sebastian Smee to the ICA. Well, hello, everyone. It's so uh, lovely to see you all here, and thanks so much for coming along. Uh, it's, a, it's an honor to be here on the stage with Peter and William. Um, we uh, were chatting a little earlier on. The message might not have quite got through to, uh, to Jill, and uh, my, our apologies for that. But rather than beginning with a presentation, as, as uh, she suggested, uh, we thought we'd just have a conversation, uh, which will, which will uh, go on and, and will sort of ad lib it a little bit. Uh, and, uh, and so, I, you know, I know that most of you have probably seen, I, I hope you have seen The Refusal of Time. I think the obvious thing is just to begin uh, by asking how it all began. I mean, it's a collaboration, and I have a strong sense that, that you two are, are, are sort of involved in an ongoing conversation, which we'll, we'll get to later. But uh, it would be fascinating to hear from, from both of you how it began. Perhaps first you, Peter. Well, we have a, um, a mutual friend, David Edwards, who was organizing some collaborations between scholars and artists, and he asked if we might like to meet, which we did in New York in 2010. And we began to talk about a variety of things, but soon sort of found a common place and time in the late 19th, early 20th century, a kind of interest in, in aesthetics, of modernism that wore its function on its sleeve, uh, interest in technology and colonialism, uh, many things about that. And we soon zeroed in on, uh, even further, on the idea of doing something about time, that moment when time became so important to the standardization of machines and peoples in Europe and the United States and train lines, but also uh, thinking about what it meant at a more metaphorical level. We began to meet once a week while William was installing, uh, rehearsing the nose, Lincoln Center, and I was teaching a course at NYU on, uh, on Thomas Pynchon's Gravity's Rainbow, and we began to meet and talk about things. And those conversations took a long time. We really were meeting pr pretty consistently for part of a semester, and then meeting in Europe at various places, in the United States, and New York, and elsewhere. And Peter, your book, I, I shouldn't interrupt, but your, your book, Empires of Time, um, Einstein's Clocks and Poincaré's map um, had come out at this stage. So I'm interested, you know, you must have, William, read this around this time, or had you already read it? Um, no, I mean, at the, there's a prehistory to the meeting with Peter, which also has to do with Dave Edwards, who came to, who's a person who has an institution in Paris that brings artists and scientists together. And he was in Johannesburg, and he came and said, am I interested in, is any particular part of science? Do I want to work with a scientist? And I said, no, I didn't have... No, any science? I didn't think so. Uh, he said, what about nanotechnology? Aren't you fascinated by nanotechnology? He said, no, I was fascinated by it, but I couldn't imagine either working at that scale or... And then I remembered I had of some, maybe a year or so before, read an article about a, a German scientist and the period when they, were just, when they were finding the speed of light and discovering that light was not instantaneous, but that it took a finite time to get from its point of origin to its point of reception. And once you had that time, that light was not instantaneous in its movement, it meant you could start turning distance into time. You could work out that an image had to take a finite time to reach a certain distance in space. And so instead of thinking of space as this empty void, you could think of space as this area that was dense with images emanating out from the Earth and that it was filled with images. If you were 2,000 light years away from Earth, you could see things that happened on Earth 2,000 years ago. Uh, you, in his terms, you could still see our savior on the cross, or Pontius Pilate, would still be washing his hands as he watched it from that distance. So there was a way of thinking of spaces filled with these films or images that are coming out of Earth constantly, and instead of thinking of the Earth as the static object, it was this completely promiscuous producer of images. And I thought that would be interesting to project onto a ceiling, all these images. But when I told, when, I, when he said, no, there must be some area, and I remembered this, and I said, in fact, yes, I'm very interested in the, the prehistory of relativity. What was happening 
in science before Einstein. In the same way, you have the prehistory of cinema, when you have zoetropes and thermoscopes and phenakistoscopes that were all necessary um, stages in arriving at, uh, at the cinema. It didn't arrive from, from nothing, the cinema. And I was interested in, was there something behind? And he said, oh, well, then it's obvious. We've just got to read Peter Gallison's book and meet him. So then I did, I did, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure if I met you first and read the book or read the book and then uh, met you, but it is an astonishing read. And it still is an astonishing. Well, this this might be a good a good time to, to Peter, if you don't mind, give us a, a summary or, or you know talk briefly about the you know the key ideas because it's a fascinating read. Well, one of the things that I think interests both William and me, in different ways and then in overlapping ways in, in our project was the idea that there are very abstract ideas that come down to something concrete, and all of my work has been trying to think about things that seem like they exist entirely in the realm of ideas and yet turn out to have something extremely mach machines and glue and oil and electric sparks at its root. And when I, I, I was one day standing in a station in, in, in Northern Europe in a train station and looking at the clocks on the station and I saw they were all lined up and I thought that was, they were good clocks. And then I saw that their second hands were all lined up, and I said, no, these can't be good clocks. They're coordinated clocks. And then I remembered something from the, the very first paper that, of relativity theory, the most famous paper in the history of modern physics the last 200 years. Einstein said, if we want to understand time, we have to imagine trying to coordinate clocks between train stations or in a train station. What does time mean? And he said, well, if a train comes into the station and we say it arrives at 12 o'clock, I mean that the front of the train is in front of my nose just when the small hand is pointing to 12. But what do I do if I want to say in some adjacent town that the train is arriving there at 12 o'clock? Then I need some way of coordinating my clocks. And then he described this exchange of signals. And I wondered whether Einstein had seen these coordinated clocks in a station and began to look at the patents. Einstein had been, couldn't get a job anywhere. He was, his teachers couldn't stand him. He couldn't get a job in university, couldn't get a job in a high school, could barely get a job tutoring one or two people. One of them became his best friend. And he, um, but he finally, through connections, got a job in a patent office. And his job was to review these patents, including the patents on electrically coordinated clocks. Switzerland was just installing these things. And I, I uh, the, the, the thesis of the book is really that these experiences of the exchange, the exchange of time, I love this moment when it turns out that in Paris and Vienna they pumped compressed air under the city in tubes and that would set up a clock to be at a certain time when it arrived. So you, had, you were literally pumping time under Paris and I thought that was such a funny idea that something as abstract as time could be pumped and people would buy, you know, clocks that the rich people would buy clocks that would have their little tube coming up to the to their apartment and set their clock and so one of the things that we began to talk about one of the first things we talked about was how this this pump time could could somehow lead somewhere the idea of coordinating clocks could could lead something somewhere that could be staged and William you were interested in the, breathing yeah. and I mean so I mean what what happened was that as Peter was describing these objects and these experiments and these different things uh, my side of it was very much saying, right, how does this transform itself in the studio into something material, into a sound, into a physical object? And so this, this, these stories and these, this history of these tubes going under the streets of Paris pumping time firstly gave the idea of wind or breath as one of the materials of the piece. And we tried for a long time to say, well, could we have, instead of clocks, because those to get a pulp of air, could we get two tubers and send pulses of air to the tubers and get a kind of automaton tuba playing. And one of the things we failed at was to how to make a rubber embouchure, an artificial embouchure for the, for the uh, so that went into a room of failures that. Uh, That's surely you know, impossible, I that mean, it's, it's so No, hard. we could, for a million dollars, we could have bought one from the Toyota company in <laughs> Japan that had a robot that could play a tuba. <laughs> but with an old car tire wired together and compressed air going in, we couldn't manage. But the idea then became that breath, that brass instruments, 
it started informing part of the material of the, of the project. It was like a distant ancestor to the thought of that big breathing machine in the middle of the piece. So it's, in one sense, it's starting very literally. It's saying, here's a description of, uh, in the same way that Einstein starts very literally, how do we coordinate these two actual clocks in this train station with this pattern for getting the clocks right? It starts from the literal, and then you see what the literal suggests. And so one of the questions that was hovering behind the project, that's not des described in the project, is saying this kind of activity or the way of imagining in the studio going from the story of the clock to saying, well, let's actually make it, get rubber pipes and pump air and let the breath and take the body's breathing be part of it. Is that analogous in a way to what a scientist would also be doing in this very uncertain, quite bodily way of thinking, here I have two clocks, what is it set going in my mind to solve the question, rather than those ideas having their origin in pure mathematics or in the realm of that's removed from the physical and bodily world. So that's not the subject of it, but it's one of the questions raised to be as saying, what does it mean for someone whose realm is scholarship and history to be working with someone whose realm is the room of the studio? Mm. One of the things that, I mean, you see here a picture of uh, a chamber underneath Savran, out, then outside, now inside Paris, but it, it's where the standards were kept and the meter stick that was in that tube at the top and K, the, the standard kilogram, was at the bottom. And the French invited all of the plenipotentiaries and representatives from all the countries of Europe and the United States and Canada to come and each one would receive a sample that they would take back and use as the standard. And what I loved about this is it had something that's very characteristic of the Third Republic in France, which was a kind of transmogrified religious moment into the secular. And so K was surrounded by these witnesses, they would call them les témoins, who would testify with their body should something untoward happen to K. And, um, and just this idea that at a certain moment when the clock struck 12, that K would go from being, say, 1.0001 kilograms to being perfectly one. It would be the exactly one. And everything else would then have to be measured in terms of it. And the same for the meter stick. And the, 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 the attention, the enthusiasm, the sort of veneration, the trans transformed religiosity that goes into this shows you that even in something as purely technical as the standards of weights and measures lies a metaphorical realm that invests these things with importance and nothing more so than time. And that, I think, was so crucial for what we were thinking about because nobody in the in the medieval period, in the Renaissance period, in the history of art, in the history of science, has ever spoken about time without it being more than time. It's I mean, never just time. I mean, metaphor. Okay, yeah. For me, I would get caught halfway by thinking it's astonishing, these beautiful glass bell jars uh, encapsulating this platonic object, this pure object. So I thought, well, what in fact if you have the platonic coffee pot or the platonic <laughs> cat with the witnesses, with these witnesses, that sort of... And it's a kind of a theatrical staging of it. And so at one stage in the project, there was going to be also maybe in the room of failures, all these other not quite perfect platonic objects. Not at the stage saying, what does that mean? What are the implications of making a sculpture of a bad cat or a coffee pot that doesn't work? Um, but I suppose being caught by the, the devotion to the object, to the idea that you could have a perfect object encapsulated in the... And then what's also fantastic is that, in fact, the perfect case started losing weight. And I think it, only in the last few years. Yeah, well, during, our, during our project, we were, one day I was reading the, the technical journal and it said that K had lost weight relative to all the other standards of weight. So I calculated that in a billion years or so, it would be completely gone. You would have this empty <laughs> bell jar. And, and then the, 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 fant the phantasmagoric image of these objects being raised, a kind of ascension of the kilogram, would be complete because it wouldn't be there anymore. So Peter, but as you say, this, this you know, drive to standardize weight and so on also related to the drive to standardize time. And you know, this very practical problem of how to synchronize clocks was what led into relativity, uh, Einstein's big breakthrough. And I wondered if you could speak a little more about that and about 
about the sort of real world ramifications as well. I mean, in terms of map making and uh, you know, railway timetables and so on. So before Einstein did his famous work of uh, May, June 1905, he, there was already a huge project that was involved with mapping the world because to, con to map the world was also to control it, to be able to send information, to attack colonial revolts in Africa, in Southeast Asia, other places. The British fleet could be controlled, but you had to know where North America was r relative to Europe, for example, to avoid the sandbars of Cape Cod or the shoals of Ireland and so on. So some of the great scientists of the time, the great mathematician, philosopher, uh, and physicist Henri Poincaré was in charge of the Bureau of Longitude. And what they do is they'd send an electric signal like the pulse of air, only an electric signal, say from Paris to Recife in, in, in Brazil and then bounce it back and then use that to figure out how far it was to Recife. And this was important because it became the mapping of the world was part of understanding it. And this technology of exchanging time, taking into account, as William said before, of the finitude of the transmission of light or of an electric signal was crucial in this. So there was already a sense of coordinating clocks by the exchange of a signal, but taking into account that it took time to get a signal from one place to another. That was a real technological, cartographic, military problem in the late 19th century. And what Einstein and Poincaré did in different ways was to take this everyday technology of mapping and coordinating clocks and bring it into the center of physics. And Einstein had worked on this problem of electrodynamics when you're moving in the world through what they thought was a big ether everywhere. And he realized that the final key to his puzzle was in coordinating clocks by this this very simple idea. You send a signal at 12, gets to you in the audience at 12.01, bounces back to me at 12.02, and I know how long the round trip took, so I, can know, I know how long it'll take to you, so I can coordinate clocks all over the world. And so this very practical problem of mapping and then of physics and then of philosophy of what simultaneity really was, was coordinated clocks, nothing more. It wasn't something in the sensorium of God. It was... It was the coordination of clocks by the exchange of signals. Mm. And each of these moments, the mapping of the world, the coordinating of clocks, the suppression of local time in favor of time zones, and the slogan that we use in the piece, give me back our, give me back our son, or give us back our son, was, a, was something that the local mayors would say, we, we want our noon back, not the noon of some central observatory. Right. And the, Einstein's idea that every observer has his or her own time, then met a new kind of resistance. And so over and over again, we became interested in this idea of resisting the imposition of a new form of time. I think that then what also, there's an, another transformation that starts to happen in the process. So there's the, there's the history of ideas which you've already discovered are not pure ideas. They're ideas that are emanate and go back to practical objects in the world, real problems in the world. And then in the studio, they get turned into a tuba playing, a breathing machine, chalk drawings of signals being going across the world, a kind of music, a breathing. And then what happens is that you start to say, well, what does this actually suggest, not only backwards towards uh, the photograph of the objects and its witnesses, but what does it suggest in a world that's where the people at the exhibition or the people in the studio are with? And it suddenly becomes much more, um, not just embodied in that it's about the body, that a clock becomes your lungs or your heart, um, but it becomes, as I suppose, all discussions of time, what becomes in a certain sense about mortality. So, the black hole is a description of extreme gravity that won't allow any object out of its uh, point of attraction, but it also very quickly becomes an image of the familiar black hole dug in the ground that we're going to end up in. And the breath is both a metaphor for time itself, for the pumping of air going under the streets of Paris, but it also brings it back into being that sense of the body as, it's, as a walking clock, people as walking clocks going to run down at a certain time. So I think it's that, that second transformation from the project 
outwards and what it suggests, that, that also becomes a vital part of the conversations and the, and the works. Not if it's just science and then it gets given to the artist and the artist does it and then it's done. It's the conversation that, the conversation and the process of working, first with Peter but then with all the other collaborators on the uh, project, that enable the larger or the final form to start to emerge. Hey, one of the conversations that we had at the very beginning of the project was one where William said to me, I don't want to make an illustrated science lecture. And I said, that's good because I don't want to make, I don't want to be the science advisor to an art project. And in fact, they're actually the same thing. That is to say, what we wanted not to do was the same thing, which was to make a kind of one-to-one -one correspondence, you know, as if we were, you know, the advisor to a police procedural show where mm. the idea was to make it look real the way a policeman reaches for a gun or sits at a desk or files a report or a scientist adjusts a test tube or talk, writes on the board. It wasn't that. We weren't looking for that. We were looking, we're, and I think William you know, constantly pushed us to, 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 to let go, in a sense, of that kind of tight attachment and to allow us to explore what things felt like and, uh, and, and, and expressive forms that were, that were actually start in the science, go somewhere else, but actually reveal something about what the science is about. I mean, the, calling these things the witnesses was already something about the, science, the scientific experience that was not just what we would parodically represent as the equations of science, as if that was all there was to it. And I think the thinking about metaphor and the way it functions um, and the affective content of what these ideas meant for us, what our mortality meant, and our resistance to mortality, our hope for something that would mm. go on, mm. our fears about our mortality, was something we constantly came back to. Mm. And you, I mean, you mentioned us, there were other collaborators, and, and uh, you know, I wondered, William, if, you, if you'd want to say something about, about who they were, and especially, I, I'm thinking about sound and the way sound functions in, in a metaphorical and, and sort of slippery way in, in, this, in this piece. It's, it's entirely well, it's, affecting. I mean, to talk about the, the sound and the music, that's uh, Philip Miller, the South African composer, is a very central collaborator in the, in, the, um, in the piece because sound was one of the ways of making concrete uh, material the invisibility of time. In the sense, we could slow it down, we could speed it up, we could, in a utopian way, kind of run it backwards, so there was a, uh, a wonderful Australian singer, Joanna Dudley, who is, does extraordinary things with the voice, and one of the things her task was to sing a song by Hector Berlioz in reverse, the Spectre de la Rose, to sing it backwards, which is extremely difficult, both to analyze it and to get your mouth to have the explosion at the end of a line rather than at the beginning of a line and all of those things. And it's a kind of nonsense. My father was visiting the... Uh, the studio while we were doing it, and he asked her, oh, Joanna, what do you do in the project? She says, oh, she's got to sing things. He said, what do you have to sing? He said, well, she said, well, one of the things I have to sing uh, the Spectre de la Rose backwards. And he said, oh, he said, just remind me what it was that Berlioz got wrong when he wrote it forwards. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it was, uh, she just looked it up. What am I meant to say to this? So it is, I mean, that's a legitimate question. And sing the Spectre de la Rose backwards is a nonsense stupid idea, but there is something kind of extraordinarily moving in the possibility of things undoing themselves, of being able to take back the word you wish you hadn't said, of to undo the email that's been sent to the wrong people, to unsend, to unsave, to what would it be if one could reverse time, the kind of the regret that we can't. So all these other sort of emotional elements start coming out of what's a physical, you know, an exercise in music to start with, which have to do with wish fulfillment, regret that one can't do all these things, of <laughs> thinking of things you'd want to undo. Um, so those are kind of ways where the studio had to be a place for, and I'm not sure this would be interesting to know if that's also the case in science and in either the blackboard or the laboratory or the office, where one has to make a safe space for uncertainty and stupidity, for not knowing why you're doing something as well as quite what you're doing, but in the belief that if you're open to it, you will recognize those elements that are worth uh, pursuing. And I think that was, 
in a way, that was the fundamental mm -hmm. precondition, both for working with Peter, but also working with Philip, the composer, and the costume designer, and the person who worked with actors, and Dada, Masilo, the dancer. It wasn't as if I could tell them, or any of us could tell them, quite what we were doing. There was lots of surrounding vocabulary and, and raw material to work with, all these extraordinary um, histories on ways that people had thought about and the absurd machines they'd actually made. Yes. Mm. And we tried many things that didn't, that didn't work. I mean, I, I mean, one of my bad ideas was that um, we had this idea that, that the, 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 act, the, the, the piece would, or something like a structure of thinking for the piece, would function in this imposition of absolute time, then Einstein's relative time, and then the idea that things fall apart at the edge of a black hole and this dispute among physicists that still continues about whether information is lost if you threw an encyclopedia into a black hole. Would that information go away? Quantum mechanics says no. Relativity says yes. And how do you reconcile these? A big issue for string theorists. But the idea that information could be somehow preserved had, again, a resonant effect, a resonant meaning, a sort of the idea that somehow something would be preserved of us in the end. And um, so the question was, how do you picture or imagine or hallucinate to the idea of information falling away? And at first I thought, well, maybe we could do something with Morse code, this sort of quintessential early 20th century technology of information. And we tried, Philip gallantly tried to integrate it into some of the music, and it didn't work. And then um, looking at, the, at a player piano in William's studio and the, the, the reader of the perforated paper that takes those dots and dashes on the paper and transmits them into an action on the keyboard um, looked to me like a, for, a, a code. I mean, it is a code. And you, the placement of those. And, and I thought, well, I said, William, look, this could be our information moving. And he said, let's project it. And it looked beautiful when you projected this through the moving paper. And it shows up in the piece, this, f these falling, like wisps of information falling down in, in, mm. in one of the pieces. And that became you know, the residue of the black hole depiction. Right, right. Because it is a real information. I mean, the, there the transformation was to shift it from a horizontal movement to a vertical movement and to invert it from black holes on the white paper to the white holes on the black sheet, and it had a very strange uh, quality of this very silent falling of, a, a sort of a falling of information. Um, there was, it's gone, it's gone. We'll come back to it, I'm sure. We'll back <laughs> but it's, I mean, it's a very poignant part of the, the, the film, or the installation, where, uh, I mean, this idea that we, we, you know, some part of us remains, um, uh, is double-edged, isn't it? it? It might be reassuring, but this sense that there is this kind of universal archive out there in, in space, you know, light signals but, being I mean, just pinging to, around. To describe yeah. it, I'm sure I'll get it slightly wrong, but Peter, but if you'll forgive me. So there's either the theory that if you go towards a black hole, you're swallowed by it and nothing is left, you're irrevocably gone. And other people saying no in terms of maybe it's entropy, that your information slows down and the vibrations get redder and slower and it turns into, in my understanding, my simplification was that, turns into these strings of information, into these kind of knots and twists of vibrating strings of information that are circling the edge of the black hole, the edge of the event horizon. And for me, whether the science is right or wrong, what it corresponds to is saying, is this black hole, is death the last thing that we're going to go to and nothing is lost? Or scientists, some scientists need to believe no, there has to be some possibility of some reconstruction, some resurrection of this information that can be recalled. And you suddenly realize what's at the edge of physics is in fact this question that's been asked for thousands of years. And that has to do with understanding the, but it also has to do with the temperaments, the psychic needs of the people having what we assume are pure scientific thought. Hmm. I mean, it's, it's why for the, the I remember once one of my colleagues in, in said to me, uh, oh, well, the difference between art and science is art uses metaphors, and in, in, in science, we don't, we don't use metaphors. Mm. And, uh, and I said, what do you do? He said, string theory. I, said, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when we were talking about string theory, also, just, it starts very basically I mean, with this, this question of what happens when you throw an encyclopedia into a black hole. That was enacted by getting our 
the dance of Dada Masilo and a whole set of old LaRouche encyclopedias, which are very heavy and getting her physically to hurl these at a wall repeatedly. And it became both about this question, the encyclopedia disappearing into the black hole, but it also became about an image of rage and repeated rage and being stuck in it. At one stage, I think Sabine was trying to learn all the various variations of cat's cradles. So literally working with string to do, and either she wasn't good enough at it, or it was, even if she was good, it wasn't a very interesting representation to play with in the projections as drawings, as raw material. So it's not as if every idea is a good idea. They have to kind of earn their keep or prove their use as the project develops. Which is an interesting point. I mean, in science, metaphors do slide about, but they kind of, they're held to stricter standards in a way, aren't they? I mean, if a, if a metaphor leads to a, a category mistake or confuses levels of abstraction, you get yourself in trouble. Whereas it seems to me that, that in making art, there's much greater sort of amplitude and, and, and possibility. And I wonder if, you know, you, you, as, as a scientist or historian of science, you feel a, a kind of envy or you felt a relish in, in working with this, this sort of wider possibilities, perhaps. Well, I, th I think there is a kind of understanding that comes from pushing on the art in the ways that William encouraged us to go, to, 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 to allow us to, to feel the, to, 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 to bring out things like witnesses and hmm. whether things come to a final end I mean, it, or, or whether there's something residually left. And these story, a lot of the stories that interested me that I, that I, that I, that I brought to our early conversations were ones where there was more intensity in a kind of almost psychoanalytic sense, more historical intensity at a certain point in the development of physics than would seem to be merited by the equations alone. I mean, something in excess was there. Uh, there's a moment when that becomes one of the melodramas in the, in the piece where a, a French terrorist anarchist named Marcia Bourdin uh, emigrated, fled to London, to the club uh, d'autonomie there, where these anarchists had gathered. And one day he decided he would blow up the meridian, blow up the Greenwich Observatory, where the center of time. So he built a bomb, and he was walking up the observatory hill, up towards the observatory, when he had what is called in the Middle East these days a work accident. And um, <laughs> that was it for him. But the people in the observatory looked, uh, I mean, heard the explosion, and one said to the other, you know, that's dynamite, mark the time, 4.51. And it was sort of this moment of a collision between the imposition of time and order and this attempt at, at, at explosive anarchy. Mm -hmm. And then that became the theme in 1907 for Joseph Conrad's most popular book, The Secret Agent. The Secret Agent then became the subject for Ted Kaczynski, the Unabomber's um, destructive many year rage against technology. Um, and so there's a kind of back and forth between history, technology, science, fiction, back out to, the, to science, anti-science. And you know, in a way, we're taking it and trying to push on ideas and to see in, the, in a fictional, associative way to get at what the intensity of that worry and counter-worry were about, the order of coordinated time, the anti-order of an anarchy trying to break it up into free oneself from this imposition. And You're that right, tension I mean, comes back over and over again in the piece. And it is almost sort of too much, all these stories. I mean, the other story, of course, is, is uh, Einstein's friend, Friedrich Adler. What, uh, could you tell us just, just quickly about that? Because that, that, that's extraordinary. So one of Einstein's close friends and next door apartment mate and uh, someone he shared notes with and admired hugely was a guy named Friedrich Adler in, in Vienna. I uh, sorry, in, uh, who came, came from Vienna, but they were students together in, in, in Switzerland. And Adler became a terrorist. His father ran the Socialist Party, the sort of the loyal opposition, and young Friedrich uh, Fritz Adler uh, killed the prime minister of, uh, of Austria in World War I because the prime minister, well, one of the main reasons was because of his censorship and dissolution of the means of democratic uh, decision making. And, uh, Einstein defended him and testi you know, wrote testimony to go to court. And, and then Adler, when he was in prison, wrote letters and eventually started attacking Einstein as having gotten relativity wrong. And his father called in Einstein as a witness because uh, to Adler's insanity, the insanity of opposing Einstein. So it was, <laughs> it's this kind of wild exchange between 
tragedy, war, fiction, fantasy, psychic disorder, uh, and the greatest scientist of the 20th century. And I, I found that Einstein then made this into a play that he published, uh, a kind of a thought play uh, modeled on Galileo, uh, uh, the dialogue of two world systems, where Criticus, the critic, sort of another version of Adler in some ways, and Einstein sort of exchange, you know, exchanged views about relativity. And so, so this, the, the relationship of fiction and science and metaphor and technology and order and disorder is, is all over the, the point of exchange between art and science, it seems to me, at least the part that I think interests us. And William, the, I mean, the title itself, I mean, did that, was that easily agreed on? Did it come out of Adler's uh, attempt to No, it didn't to sort come of, out of that. No, it, right. it, I mean, we tried, there were a lot of quite lame, you know, there were different ones, you know, Three Rivers of Time, um, I don't know, once it arose, it felt the right. It was right. Because it's both, I mean, it, it's both uh, trying to refuse the strictures of time, so it's a ridiculous project. You know, it's a project doomed to failure to mm. refuse time. But it's also kind of, it's quite elegantly gives time an agency. You invite time to the dance, but uh, time gives you a gentle refusal. The refusal of time, I'm not taking part in your thing. But I think one of the, one of the, which I hadn't thought about really until now, but one of the, principles of making this piece was excess, that many different images could come and take their place. The fragmentary melodramas, if we'd come across a roll of film, either of the blowing up of the meridian or this kind of French farce of the wife, the lover, and the husband that gets played out in fragmentary forms, almost as if one had found these fragments. And so what the piece is doing, even though it didn't find a beautiful ceiling to do the projection on the ceiling, in a way it becomes, the piece as a whole becomes a sort of representation of this project of the universal archive, of space filled with these traces of things that had happened. So there, you know, there are all the different chapters that don't really go anywhere complete in themselves, but refer back to some events or some thoughts that had happened on the earth, whether it's anti-colonial revolts, which are shown in the section on give us back our sun, or in the... Um, the signals that are sent, or the blowing up of the meridian melodrama that's also, also made. Even the form of the melodrama is a kind of excess, right? It's, a, it's an excessive art form. It's a form of push to extremes and overflowing in some way. Mm. I mean, the, uh, the, the, the melodramas, you see the blowing up of the meridian and there's a fragment of the, um, of the wife, the lover, and the husband. Those are kind of done also to say, in the middle of the workshop, there's a workshop with maybe 15 of us in the studio for 10 days, to say we've been working very hard with musicians and trying to and play pianos and string quartets and brass players. And it's getting very hard and heated. And so right, what are we going to do tomorrow morning? We'll make a film. This evening, we can work out what it is and paint the sets and make the costumes, and we give ourselves three hours tomorrow morning to film it, and then we'll get back to the real work. And so there's a sense of saying, let's take something that's at right angles almost to what we are doing and see if it has a connection. And so everybody was dragged in to paint the set to, uh, in the evening, and the costume designer, Greta, found bits of costumes we could work, and we said, well, let's do it very simply like French farce. A film made around, if 1905 is the key era of Einstein's paper, let's do a film that could have been made in 1905. So a silent... Uh, quite simple film with very primitive cinema effects, film effects, and it was an improvisation, and a lot of it, in fact, wasn't used here. There was a lot more material, but everything was one take only. There was no script. There was no, uh, there was no text or understanding of how it was going to fit into the piece. It was almost to say, let's take something that's completely out of the, what seems to be outside the argument or the description, and we'll see once it's made, or while we're making it. So halfway through making it, uh, Peter said, think about the encyclopedia. So he got some encyclopedias, and I said, well, we haven't got a black hole, so we'll just throw them at the door. But this can... And then later on, so what happens is it constantly gets repeated. The encyclopedias mm -hmm. go down and come back, and go down and come back. And if you're caught in a kind of zoetrope time warp, which you can't quite escape out of. So the idea of zoetropes, which is a circular action a very simple action, a person taking a step, but it's repeated endlessly, is both an early cinematic device, it's very much about time, it's not a static image, it's a moving image, but it's locked in time. 
And so that's about the pressure we feel for narrative. Wanting a person, if he's just walking over a chair, for example, endlessly, to trip on one of these, to fall out for the, something to interrupt the narrative. So the, and once we'd made the first melodrama, so okay, we found this form of this very simple, quickly painted mm -hmm. uh, set. So later on when we came back, so we let's do the melodrama of the blowing up of the uh, Meridian. Maybe we can yeah, show, show you a, a few pictures. Just let it, we'll talk, we can talk it through. As so this is the center of time. Of oh, yeah. so, uh, this is where you bought your pneumatic clock. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know what the Statue of Liberty is doing there. but uh, uh, And this is a fellow who said he, uh, his whole poetic, uh, po well-established poet, who said in 1880 that the pumps of air were destroying his creativity. I mean, it's the kind of thing you dream about, right, That of finding somebody who actually would bring suit against these time systems for destroying poetry. Uh, this is the guy. Um, uh, and, but these, I want to show you the sets. Oh, this was the, the dance of the meter stick, one of the things that didn't quite make it into prime time. <laughs> and, uh, but I'll show you the sets for the... Um, You've got that one, the, the yeah. compressor. So this, is, this yeah. uh, was the table where you blew yeah, So again with these, we had the principle that we had an hour to paint the set and two hours to shoot each sequence, or maybe two hours to paint the set and one hour to shoot each sequence. So we had a day to do the blowing up of the meridian, the five different scenes that you see. Here we had string left over when we were thinking about string theory. Literally, there were pieces of string to turn the clock, to move the clock. Um, were, everybody in the studio was, was roped in to, to do it. The person on the left is the person who runs the foundry and does bronze casting, but he was put into place. The person uh, on the... Sabina's hiding behind the clock, moving the spoons, I think. Yes, that's right. Someone <laughs> was standing behind the clock, moving the, the two enamel spoons that were the... So it was, it's very much a kind of a, a heated improvisation... Um, not and absolutely not stopping to think what does it look like, what are we doing, how is it? Um... <laughs> and um, this was the part of the, we had five rooms or five scenes that then become the five screens in the story of the blowing up of the meridian. And this is the way, uh, I'll just play it without sound, but this is a, a single channel version of the five screens that you'll see in the, in, the exhibit, in the exhibit itself. So this would be one room, the observatory, and we had a map so room, the, and a war room. So it's the same space in the studio. This place covered with a piece of curved cardboard, painted black with white dots for the stars. Various captions, of the, the map room in which people would have been mapping the, the different colonies. Um, Remind me, what and literally yeah. polystyrene balls on, on pieces of wire <laughs> on a turntable being turned below. The, the man being in, inflated was at one stage we thought, what happens if the, uh, the pneumatic clock of Paris went wrong and the, was wrongly wired and you'd have this person who swells up like a French Michelin man. So we had that suit already made and we thought, is it going to be about someone lost in space, this big white bouncing surface? And then when we came to do the map room, it became kind of an inflated globe that was being, having lines of longitude marked on it. This was the couple making the, <coughs> making the bomb. Again, people behind the clock moving the, the hands. And this is the, the club d'autonomie we moved from London to Dakar to fit in with the larger theme of making it in Africa and colonial and so on. So we had a group of two or three people in the studio that said, just draw clocks, draw lots of clocks. We've got an hour to make a lot of clocks. <laughs> and so somebody would be on the, on the Google images looking at all clocks and we'd say, yes, those five. Somebody else would be the compass. And so it was, uh, there's a kind of manic energy in constructing these scenes very, very um, quickly and then more time finally editing them and completing them. There was a machine we had, that, uh, the big bellows machine was one of the, uh, failure machines that was never used in this piece, but we'd made this very large scale bellows, which was then changed and became the elephant in the piece upstairs. It's some of these, some okay. of these captions come from uh, the Conrad book, The Secret Agent. You know, um, and we used, we, you know, we mixed the the complicated fiction fact fiction cycle into. And the, then this this dance by Dada of the um, Louise Fuller kind of dance. 
It was a costume that the costume designer had for an opera she was designing about an iceberg, and she had to make a costume for a singing iceberg. <laughs> but she wanted to test it out, so she brought it with her, and Dada, who's a great dancer, did the dance. And then to have the sense of this dress throwing all these sheets of paper up into the air, again, we simply re reversed it. So you can actually see the dress is leading her. And these sheets of paper which are being blown up into the air were, in fact, drifting down onto the onto the ground. So it's both a kind of reversal of time. It also becomes a sense of putting the images back up onto the ceiling, which is one of the first impulses behind the um, whole project and becomes a kind of a summary of the, of the story that Peter was describing of the attempt to blow up the observatory. It's wonderful to hear how much sort of improvisation was in this. Mm. And interesting that, that you describe it as sort of hectic and manic, which it must have been in such a short amount of time. But in the larger context of the piece, I think there's a sense of, um, of, of spaciousness and breathing and, and, and humor and you know, the, the slapstick and, the, uh, and the, you know, all, all this extraordinary imagery, as opposed to some other parts of the, of the, of, of the film which have a quite sort of concentrated intensity. Yes. Obviously, the beginning uh, mm. is, is one example. And, and there are others, other parts which are, are poetic and, and, and uh, have a more lyrical sort of feel. Um, I wonder, I mean, the, this idea that the piece itself has a rhythm seems well, to be yeah. fundamental. Well, I mean, one thing yeah. which we tried to do was to have the, the different speakers would have different voice, I mean, different texts coming out of them. And when we set it up at Castle, every, you know, we would disorder the chairs so that people would sit in different places and move around, and then the audience would arrange them into nice, neat rows. And then we'd come in and disarrange them again, and they'd arrange them, and finally we got people used to the idea that we wanted it to be... No, no, we didn't get them used to the idea. We screwed <laughs> them down to fix their randomness. <laughs> and that, I mean, it, 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 at a certain point, it is extremely constructed. So, it, yes, it comes out of a kind of a heated improvisation and randomness, but then a very careful period of a year of, of constructing of music and editing the sound, both by the composer and by the sound mixer, uh, Gavin Eckhart, and of the editing and constructing of the rhythm of the piece by Catherine Mayberg, the editor. But yes, certainly, for example, at the beginning when the metronomes right. begin, they do get very intense, and that's the sound. I mean, the image doesn't really change. They go slightly faster or slower. But the, all the intensity is built up by the fantastic uh, soundtrack that, uh, that Philip constructed. Right. At a certain point, the piece was going to be a live performance that was going to be in Kassel for three months. And we thought we'd have to get German students to, for a summer job to come and perform. And it would be a mixture of installation and performance. When you say Kassel, you're talking about it, the documenter. Documenter, uh, the uh, show every which was first shown as a big uh, exhibition in Germany every five years in the t small town of Kassel. And then at a certain point, uh, there was a question that went through the whole thing of what to do about the actual information. We didn't want people to... There were such remarkable stories. We wanted people to hear them. So it went through stages of Peter lecture, you know, giving a wonderful lectures to the whole group, to all the, uh, um, all the participants, and then me working on the ideas of the lectures and shortening them, and then Philip Miller, the composer, at one point saying, you understand, you have to perform them. At which point I said, well, then it's not going to be a performance piece. It's going to be an installation piece. And then fragments of the lectures you can still hear come out of the cones. But there's also a version of the piece called Refuse the Hour, which is a one-hour, 20-minute uh, piece for a theater, which overlaps with the video and images in the installation, but is also very different. It's eight musicians, and it's only one projection screen, and it's a dancer and an actor, and it's... Hopefully it will come to the United States in a year. Right. And it's not to be confused with this idea you have of the room of failures. It's its own thing. So we, <laughs> but the, you, the, you the, had the, this idea. The original piece, we, the, the, there was a space, which happily we didn't get, but we thought we were going to get, which was a huge room. It was actually the top of an old early 19th century theater in Kassel. And, we were gonna, and then an adjacent room, which was a kind of a gallery of, that had these indentations in the wall that we thought... Well, that could be our museum of failures, and we could install all the things that didn't work, uh, and didn't work in different ways, and we would build it there. And then there was the, going to be the performance. So there was the performance, the installation, the museum of failures, and they became three. And then we began to talk more recently, or over 
intermittently over the last year or two about what this museum of failures might become. And we've been continuing and expanding that discussion to imagine you know, what it would be like. And one of the thoughts is, uh, I've, I've done some, some work on how Freud's idea of psychic censorship and self-censorship came in, was shaped in part by his experience of wartime postal and, and um, newspaper censorship in Vienna in 1916-17. And he talks about that and he begins to sketch out the mind as if it's a kind of field of battle where you have to bring a message and then it's censored and there's a censor there from the unconscious to the conscious and then from to the preconscious and then from the preconscious to the conscious. And you know, all the time he's, his letters are doubly censored, first in Vienna and then say, uh, as it goes to a, a city in Germany. And so we've been talking recently in a speculative imag imagined way about what it would be like to think about spatializing and materializing ideas of incompleteness, of trying to understand something but having it out of your grasp. So, I mean the, so the, the kinds of things that spread from that would be, is it part of a text which is painted on a wall and a projection which completes it in different ways? So certain letters that occur in certain positions but which could be incorporated into many different texts? Is it a performer with a kind of a trowel of black caviar, as they used to call it, this thick black ink to place across photographs or pieces of text? Um, so that's another kind of way that it might come in. So is it about very clean or dirty <coughs> sheets of paper? I'm immediately thinking, what scale are they? Are they large sheets? Are they small sheets? Is it a projection? Is it a person on... Um, on stage, what are the 20 different ways one could actually make it in the studio? Um, and sound, too. You know, they, when Freud, one of his first mentions of censorship is when he says, you know, in a correspondence, he says, you know what it, it's like when the Russian censors use their caviar on letters or newspapers or history books, and they block out with black ink what part of the something had been. And he says, that's actually like what our memory is like. And, and when we start to act and speak and dream in incoherent ways, it's often because things have been removed from the text of our memory and association. And we were wondering about what that would be like in an auditory way, if, if, if sound became blurred or incomplete, or you were unable to see very well through a distorting glass. Or unable to, to retrieve, I guess. And I suppose this relates to the refusal of time. I mean, you've, William, always been interested in, in or, or played around with the idea of failure and, and, and the sort of freedom that it bestows. In this, it, it does until you name it. Right. So as soon as we said, oh, let's do a room of failure, <laughs> then everybody got completely hooked and said, all right, let's design 15 failures. <laughs> and um, that all then got incorporated into the, the piece. The, I mean, the only one I can think of that completely failed was our attempt to make this mechanical tuba and there are two beautiful tubas sitting in my studio and we just need a piece of good red rubber, India rubber piping and it becomes a, a strange non-communicating object in the room. Uh, but there are a lot of things that float at the edge of the edge of what people are thinking about in science, the idea of multiple universes that Peter's been telling me about. The, not just as our fantasy but it's actually a real scientific theory for many scientists. And so they wonder, one of the issues, if you think that there are many universes, each one with slightly different laws, and that that might explain why the laws that we have make it possible to have life, us, then would, how would we know about those other universes? What traces could exist without destroying us of those other worlds? And we began to think about rooms in a house or div dividing lines or dividing walls that would you would just get a trace of something on the other side, potentially destructive maybe, or intriguing, but so out I think of we need So we need to find a place which is full of old office doors, which have the glass pane with sandblasted glass. So you have all these doors you can't, can't open, and there's fragments of the edge of a face or a hand that every now and then is a trace from. And I think, well, then you put seven speakers inside these rooms you can't get into, so you hear there's another world inside there, and you just have some intimations of... Um, what it is. So there's a very elaborate, complicated soundscape that alludes to the richness of the other universe, but only the merest traces of things occasionally tantalizing you on the 
walked in. I think, are these in a row? Are these doors in a row? Are they in a maze in different uh, houses? Do we physically build separate rooms out of drywall? Do we find a venue which has got lots of old unused office rooms? Do we find an unused building which we can put 60 rooms and these 60 projectors and uh, 240 speakers uh, in the space? And do we drill a tiny hole in some of the walls so you can see odd things shifting? So it, it, it's, it's the transformation of a first idea into the way it can uh, expand and the collaborators in the studio and then are the ones through who that actually gets. And when find of the 50 ideas, there's enough time to follow one. So even in terms of the failures that one can't begin to trace, there's a huge overflow of those, of those also. But I mean, just in these conversations, which was before the talk today, talking about other universes and these possibilities, there's a kind of a galvanizing of energy saying, yes, let's get to what would be the sounds, what would be the images that would do that. And do you see black holes, you know, fitting into this in any way? I mean, they're touched on, obviously, in, in the refusal of time. And this, I love this sort of poetic metaphor that you have of the, the full stop that, that swallows the sentence, this idea of retrieval against the idea of perfect memory that exists with this idea of the universal archive. Um, do you, you know, is... is do you think black I mean, there's a, there's a way in which, this is just again thinking aloud, if you talk about that black covering over a text, right. you know, that ink that obliterates a text, it also in a way becomes that swallowing up of a history, of a life, of a memory, of a, of a thought. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm sure they come. There's if, much to be done with black ink and paper. <laughs> yes, <laughs> there is much to be done with black ink and paper. Well said. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> One thing we haven't, I mean, we've touched on, but, you know, the elephant in the room. I mean, the, the big thing that you first see uh, when you come into the installation um, is this big structure. Um, and I wonder if, if you could tell us about how that functions in itself and metaphorically. Um, and well, the, there's a wonderful Swedish uh, constructor and inventor who I'd worked with on a project called Black Box. And he was part of the team to think about the different mechanical machines. He's a person who I couldn't believe. I thought if anyone in the world can make this artificial embouchure, mm -hmm. he will be to do it. He was mortified after some months to <laughs> admit failure. Um, but we decided we wanted something that, as it were, represented the engine of the, uh, a kind of the engine of time, the engine of the whole um, piece. At first we thought it would be literally this, that air would be pumped out of a compressor and set off different sounds around the room. Then we thought, okay, it's gonna to be too complicated, but it can look at it. We'll actually put physical pipes around the pipe, even if they don't come out of the compressor and just goes to speakers. And then we realized we didn't actually need to do that physical connection of pipes to it. And then the machine itself could become more transparent so you could see through it. Um, I think it's based, I mean, it is based on a machine that would be for Bellows for some automaton, I can't remember which. It's a little bit of, it's a little bit of a pump and bellows and the pneumatic system. It's a little bit, you'll see images of the player piano mechanism. It's a little mm -hmm. bit of that uh, writ large, made large. Uh, it's a little bit of a loom and a 19th century machine world. Um, I mean, it's tight the elephant comes, which was, at one stage I said, okay, we're going to have this movement of the lungs, and then we need to have the movement of the heart, so we need something that's going to go tuck, 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 much, a much different rhythm to it. And then I thought there's this great line in Hard Times of Charles Dickens where he talks about the machines in one of the industrial mills, and he said the machine moved ceaselessly like, the, uh, like an elephant in a state of melancholy madness, mm -hmm. just going up. So at one stage it had a long a head that went up and down with a long kind of trunk of chains, but that you know, the heart was taken out, the quick beating of the heart, and the head moving up and down was taken out, and the end was just left with the... Both the breathing of the arms and that rather beautiful, complicated movement inside the bellows, a kind of a reciprocating mm. turn. Which is like a loom in many ways. It made yeah. me think of... I grew up to the sound of my father at a loom that he'd built. It was one of those sit-down things, and he would be listening to the, the cricket in Australia, and I would just see this ceaseless sort of banging. And in a way, it was the most reassuring sound. I mean, he was, he was just there all weekend. I mean, you're both very interested in, in, in the way, in the ability to, to, be able to, to see how things are made and what yes. they're made of, and, and, and in, a, in a sense, what that tells us about how they function, both practically and, and in a way metaphorically as well. 
it strikes me we, we all feel very conscious of living in a world where the things that we rely on so much daily use, I mean computers and TVs and, and, and so on, we have very little grasp of how they work. And I wonder if you can reflect on that and say if you see it as a, as a problem or um, just an inevitability. Well, I think it's one of the reasons that we wanted to, the whole piece is sort of set in that late 19th, early 20th century moment. I mean, like a device like this, we can't, we can't, we have, we don't have access to its interior exactly. functioning. Um, but if you look at one of the old computers, say one built in the 19, mid, mid 1940s, it's still, you still see the relays and the punch cards that are actually the legacy of the Jacquard loom. I mean, it's all, you know, pieces of an old Marchand calculator, typewriters that are wired up to, to print out the numbers at the end. Um, and I think that we wanted to get at that because in a way, digging down to those machines and the lights and the motions and the breath, you, you actually then get closer to the metaphorical range of where these things stood for, the, for people. I mean, Galileo used his heart as a clock right. in his experiments. And, and Einstein had a light clock, Galileo a heart clock. And just, you know, you start to think heart clock to light clock, I mean, that's the transformation in some way the, of body to non, to, to, to the least embodied thing, light. And I, I think that once you start to sort of look at the functioning of what their clocks were or the machines were, you, you dig down and you, and you see up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it was certainly, it was certainly needing to find mechanical equivalents to processes that are now invisible. So for example, not in this piece used, but if you have, you think of all the lines of communication between us all, telephone, cell phone, internet, email, Facebook, all the different th ways in which we connect to different people in the world. We know that there are these lines of connection, that I'm talking to someone in South Africa on my phone, there's a kind of a virtual line that goes from me to that particular person. But if you think of a telephone switchboard in the 1920s, that would have been physically a line that it, you would take a cord out of my hole and you'd put it into the person you were going to talk to. And it was both, you could see that literal connection, but it also in a way was a drawing. It, was a, it looked like a black line that that cable made. So there was a way in which it met the, it, those old technologies both often meet the process of drawing halfway but also a way of making clear things that have now become invisible. I feel I should uh, interrupt and just check on the time. Um, are we, Monica, are we, uh... oh, all right, all right. Well, I, I want to thank Peter and William so much for, for being here and for their generosity. It's absolutely fascinating uh, to, to, to hear you speak. And thank you all so much for coming. It's been a pleasure.